there's been basically four key phases in the privatization of the NHS. And I think privatization is the key part of what is happening. Um, it's been a 30 year journey of converting the NHS from a public uh, universal healthcare system into a market system, which is where it is now, towards uh, ultimately, I think the final goal of private healthcare insurance interests, other corporate interests would be to have a two tier system with a massive expansion of private health insurance. That would really be the final aim. Um, the first phase, I'll go over the, the first three phases briefly because I think the current phase is really where we need to actually focus, or at least the current phase and, and the, 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 the previous phase. The first phase was in the 80s and 90s, and that was the introduction of outsourcing. It was the creation um, in the 90s of a limited market, what was called an internal market. And there's a lot of these buzzwords and euphemisms that, that one has to get used to. And that limited market basically meant dividing the NHS up into... It's not a... Can you hear me? Is that clearer? Yeah, that's better. There we are. And um, was dividing the NHS up into uh, trusts um, and using the principle of competition, principle of competition to um, supposedly to improve efficiency, reduce costs. Uh, and in fact, the Department of Health discovered quite quickly that it was the opposite, and it commissioned studies into this, um, which which found that actually it was escalating costs significantly. Um, and they hushed this up. Uh, and one of the things we, we now know from those studies is that administrative costs, for example, have gone up uh, by nearly 10% since the limited market was introduced. So that cost of running the limited market is something like four and a half to, two billion, to 10 billion pounds a year. Um, and that was just for the limited market. So since then, as we'll see, there's been a significant expansion uh, of that limited market into an extensive market. And that came really sadly under the new labor years. So from 2000 onwards, we saw uh, a, an expansion of, of into that extensive market with the introduction of various things. So outsourcing on a bigger scale uh, for frontline services. Um, and probably the single biggest thing was the uh, introduction of PFI, so the private finance initiative, which is a public-private partnership. And um, during those new labor years, over 100 NHS hospitals were uh, funded and built by PFI, which means that banks, financial interests uh, put up the money, uh, construction firms build them and facilities management companies run them. So that's the situation currently that over 100 uh, NHS hospitals are basically financed, owned and run by corporate consortia of banks, construction firms, etc. Um, and the UK's PFI debt um, is, is over 300 billion pounds now. So that's one of these kind of astronomical figures that doesn't mean very much. Um, but what it, what it is, to put it into some kind of perspective, is four times the size of the budget deficit that was used to justify austerity. So um, that, I think, more than perhaps any other fact, clearly illustrates and underlines that austerity is a choice. It's not a necessity. Um, so, for example, where I work, I won't go into too much detail because there's lots more to cover, but at Bart's Health, I've already spoken with someone about it, at Bart's in the Royal London, um, we, we've got the biggest PFI there, and it's, it's pretty disastrous for that local health economy because six billion extra is being siphoned off over the, the course of its mortgage term to those corporate uh, interests. Um, I'll speed up now to cover the, the more recent events. Since, 2000, since 2010 is the third phase where we've seen that the flagship reform was the Health and Social Care Act 2012. That was basically a privatization act modeled on the privatization of public utilities that we've obviously seen in preceding decades. Um, it, in legal terms, abolished the NHS. Um, it axed, firstly, the, the health secretary's responsibility to provide a comprehensive health service. Number two, it devolved that responsibility to a number of quangos and bodies like NHS England, your local groups, the clinical commissioning groups, CCGs. Thirdly, it opened up uh, most, if not all, NHS contracts up to uh, basically private sector outsourcing. So potentially there's no limit to privatization of, of NHS services. We've seen the numbers on that shoot up. So Department of Health figures are around nine billion currently, or 8% of the budget for private sector outsourcing. But those figures exclude general practice, pharmacy, dentistry, for example. So that's why other authorities and sources, the Center for Health in the Public Interest, CHPI, for example, puts the figure for private sector outsourcing as high as 20 billion. My guess is it's somewhere 
in between um, if you want to hedge your bets, but that would put it still in the teens of billions, plus the costs of running the market, which are going to be several billion, plus fees going to management consultants, magic circle law firms, big four accountancy firms, big three management consultancies, etc., cetera, which, which again, I, I think would be uh, running into the billions. Um, and the cost of PFI, which is something like two to three, well, over two billion pounds a year. So you're, you're certainly looking at the costs of privatization being in the billions, if not, if you include the cost of outsourcing in the tens of billions uh, annually. Um, so that's, that's really, that was the conservative-led coalition government phase. Since 2015, which I think is, is more important to focus on, the current phase we are in uh, with a conservative government, um, has, has seen really a move towards consolidating all of that privatization. Um, the key documents being the five-year plan, the five-year forward view, uh, and of course, more recently, you might have heard of the STPs, so the sustainability and transformation plans, which are to divide up the NHS into 44 footprints, so that means merging several clinical commissioning groups, CCGs, into each area, into a footprint. And again, these are the buzzwords. So sustainability means cuts, really. So it means 22 billion pounds in cuts by, the aim is by 2020. I don't know how feasible that's actually going to be, even from their point of view. And transformation means introducing new models of care. Some of it is linked to privatization. The overall key concept here, which I think a lot of people haven't quite grasped, is integrated care. And integrated care is a buzzword. It sounds great. Who could argue with genuine integration of care? Um, it's actually what they mean by integrated care is a US healthcare concept. Um, so integrated or managed or accountable care um, is, is based, according to Jeremy Hunt, um, is, is that we should be modeling the NHS on Kaiser Permanente, who are a, a California-based uh, US uh, health organization. Um, and Simon Stevens, who's the current NHS boss, and his background's very telling because he spent the last 10 years before that working for the biggest US healthcare and insurance corporation, um, uh, United Health, um, before coming to, to be the NHS boss. Simon Stevens has also told Parliament twice that this year that these STPs, sustainability and transformation plans, will, will basically be rolled out, some of them, as this US model of accountable or integrated care. How does that translate into the NHS? Well, the plan, for example, from NHS England is to reduce the number of A&Es for the whole of England down to about between 40 and 70. Um, the number of GP surgeries, the aim is to reduce that, according to the official documents, from 7,500 GP surgeries down to 1,500, uh, 1,500 super hubs. Okay? So this is what they mean by integrated care. Again, other documents, um, if you're interested, would be the Dalton Review, which was a government uh, review into the hospital sector um, is about basically creating chains of super hospitals. And if you look at the GP uh, plans, it's to create networks of GP surgeries. Now, that means closures of smaller services. So cottage hospitals, district general hospitals, closures of those, downgrades, mergers. It also means closures of smaller GP surgeries, um, so particularly the single-handed surgeries. We've already seen hundreds, actually, of GP surgeries close. The Royal College of GPs says up to 600 more could close in the coming years. So the aim is to create these chains of hospitals, networks of GP surgeries. Really what that's about, if you follow these things in the health trades press, is about creating economies of scale that are profitable and lucrative for uh, corporate interests. So it's at some point in the future enables, and even the Dalton Review states this quite explicitly, that these chains of hospitals could be run by large NHS trusts or private companies. So that is really the ultimate aim, is, is for those to be run by, by corporate interests. Um, I'll probably have to leave it there because I've run out of um, time, but um, later we can talk about solutions, something a bit more positive. Okay, thank you.